Only because you have the kind of bulk. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So I mentioned the other day about removing the jewelry, but you may actually have to practice doing that because those of you that have had stud earrings, you know, it's easy to do it on yourself, but to reach over and do it on someone else is actually kind of hard to do. And a lot of the patients that come in with C collars, they're going to have their earrings on. They're not, you're not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to take them off, so you're going to have to. So you have to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a mother or an aunt or somebody who has stud earrings, okay? <laughs> Yeah, they're yeah, in practice. Because the type she has on her, the loops, they pull out fairly easy. Easy, But these are a little bit hard sometimes, especially the real diamonds have screw backs and you have to unscrew them. So it's a little hard to get in there with somebody else's ear and not have to pull their ear out of their, you know, the earring out of their uh, ear. Sure. Also, when you take them off, what I always did is I would take them, take a piece of tape and tape it to the back of their hand. Because if you put it in a tissue or something, it's going to get tossed or you try to put it in their clothing, maybe it falls out of their pocket. You know, you don't want to be responsible for the one that they didn't, that you lost their diamond studs. I lost a pair of one pair, my only one pair of one diamond, uh, real diamond. One fell off in the ICU, and the other one I took off, so I didn't look lopsided, and I put it in my purse in a tissue. And then I'm cleaning out my purse, threw the other one away. So we're going to send her to C7, uh, I mean C4, I'm sorry, here at the Adam's Apple. I'm going to bring the light up just a little bit. So you should have the light about at the top of the ear and then collimate side to side. Now what you don't want is a lot of light on the side here. You want to collimate fairly close to the part. The marker goes in between the chin and the shoulder. Okay, so you can collimate fairly close side to side. And you want to have your, your patient's shoulder kind of resting against the bucky with their arms down by their side. Come forward. Erica's had a lot of uh, alcohol today, so she's been wavering all morning. Every time I try to center her, she's off two inches. But it, what it makes you realize is it's not really easy to hold that still. You know, she's trying. I know she's trying to hold still for you. She's been kind of moving back and forth all morning. Okay, so you should see equal distance of light in the front and the back. Since she's um, not very tall, I can call me down a little bit more. Okay, so... Now, we want to just relax the shoulders down to have them kind of reach for their toes. If they're not able to do that or if they've got especially thick shoulders, you need to get C7, T1. Hopefully, you can get it here. We do everything we can to not have to do with swimmers because you'll see the swimmers just aren't very clear. So what can I do to get her shoulders down? Weights. Yeah, we'll give her some sand beds. Now, I wouldn't do it for a 90-year-old lady, but she won't, probably wouldn't need it. So watch where her shoulders go when she actually lets the weights pull them down. See how much farther they drop down here? So now we've got, here's C7, so we're clearly going to get the C7-T1 on her. Okay, so you need to practice with your partners. I'm not sure some of the guys you may need to work a little bit on getting the shoulders down. Okay. C7? C7-T1. You can see the bump from the vertebral prominence on C7 here. Okay, so what's the next position I should do? I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is show you all the uprights, and then I'm going to show you on the table as well. Oh, right. We didn't do that part. <coughs> okay, so before I make my exposure, have her bring her chin up and then bring her chin out. That jutting the jaw is going to get the back of the mandible off the body of the C-spine. You probably don't see people do that at the hospital, right? But I'll show you on the radiographs how it makes a difference. So you want to get the jaw back off the body of the C-spine. Okay, so now what's, what's the next position we should do? AP? Hmm? Yeah. Actually, the odontoid makes more sense because it's a vertical beam. But what do we have to do for the odontoid? 40 inches. Yes, we always have 40 inches. And you're going to have to move. One thing I want to show you, my routine was to do the lateral, both obliques, and then do the AP and the odontoid on the table. I never did them upright. But I'm going to show you upright. So I would do the um, obliques next, but when I'm going to do the obliques, look, look what happens. Because how much do I have to angle my tube? Is your, I, you, yeah, you need to keep an eye on that because I may not be able to. Like, oh, Mine cameras. Dropping. Okay, so watch what happens here. 
You have to be about enom size to even get up there. Even with a footstool, you wouldn't make it. So what? How can I fix that? Bring it to forty. That's right. All right, George. Okay, now I'm not going to move the tube again, so you guys can get resituated. <laughs> so you want to make sure and clear the tabletop because for some of you, you're going to have to go even lower. So you don't want to be banging the tube on the table here. Make sure your stuff's out of the way. What are you laughing at, tall guy? <laughs> Okay, so I've got my tube angled 15 degrees. I'm going to go ahead and do the AP axial since I've already angled my tube. So what's the next thing I do when I change my tube distance or angle? Align the box here. See what's going to happen? If you don't realign this, you're going to end up projecting your image above and you're going to miss the anatomy. Okay? Okay, so I want to make sure I'm at her C4, which is at her Adam's apple. Okay, bring your chin up. So you want to make sure the tip of the mandible and the back of the head are in the same plane. The mandible's too far down, then you're going to get it in the C1 through 2, 3, 4 area. If you bring the head back up too much, you're going to get the back of the skull in the C-spine. So you want a kind of a level line. Okay? Alright. So just open the collimation just enough so you have just a little bit of light side to side. You don't need to have this kind of light, which you'll see a lot of times people do. I'm going to call them fairly close, and you should have equal distance of light on both sides. If you don't, then your patient isn't centered. You recenter them. Hmm? I can see it on the thing, and it looks like there's more on the side, yeah. so that's why I moved. Oh, no. I think this is there's a bend in the column here. I'm just looking at the light on the... Is it 10 or 2 Hmm? Mm -hmm. It's centered at C4, so we should see from C3 down to where? T1. 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 Okay. So now that I've got the tube in this position, what what should I do next? The obliques. Yeah, the obliques, because now you don't have to mess with the tube. Your tube and your cassettes are already aligned. Just get your patient. So I'm going to do the LPL first. Open this up to the side so you can see. So I'm going to put the body 45 degrees, relax the shoulders down, no hands in the pockets, uh, chin up, and then turn the head towards the right. So you don't want the tilt like this. You want to make sure that the face, the ground line down the MSP, is parallel to the image receptor. Okay, no tilting, because if you tilt, you're going to put the mandible in the C-spine here. Okay, now notice when I center her, where the CR ends up. C6. Um, I think so. Oh, Okay, so see how the CR ends up right at the airlobe? Right over mm -hmm. the sternal clonomastoid. Mm -hmm. Now, this would be fine like this. I always did this because we could get a better, closer collimation if you put the long axis of the part with the CR. But like I said, now some CR systems, they don't want you to go diagonal. They don't like that. They want to have a parallel collimation to the cassette. So you may see some people do it like this, or you may just keep the collimation straight. Okay, so I've got light at the EAM, so I know I've got C1, and then I know I've got, here's T3, so I've got plenty of the cervical. And now, what, what do we best demonstrate with this one? With this position, what are we demonstrating? The mm -hmm. intervertebral brain mm -hmm. of the left. No. It's an oh, no. Right. 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 So right. Side up. Remember, side up on the APs. Okay, so now I'm just going to do the opposite. All right, so 45 degrees, chin up, turn the head to the right. And again, you can see how we've got even amount of collimation on both sides, and that puts the we are right at the earlobe or in the sternal quadrant muscle. Okay, any questions? All right, so what do I have left? The odontoid. Odontoid. So I'm going to go to a horizontal beam. Mm -hmm. And when you do this, think about closing your collimator down or have them close their eyes because the first thing you're going to do is go up here and look. You're going to have all this light in their eyes. So mm -hmm. have the patient close their eyes until you get your tube centered and collimated down. Okay? Set my cassette. Now you can use an 8 by 10 Since you're not using 8 by 10s in the hospital, then um, you might want to go ahead and use a 10 by 12 and just collimate. But we're going to collimate to about 4 by 4 inch collimation. So 
white marker is going to go just inside where her neck shadow is, the skin line. I'm not going to get it in the part because the part's right in the middle. But you, what a lot of people tend to do is they open the collimator up a lot just to see their marker, and you need to close down the collimation. So the collimation should just be on the outside of the cheeks here because you're just looking at the lateral masses in the odonto odontoid that's right in the center. Okay, so as far as her head position now, I need to um, grab grab the back of your neck here where your skull meets and bend your head up. <coughs> Feel that little divot? That's what I always used as a landmark. I would put my finger right at the base of the skull there. But that also shows you where the tip of the mastoid is. Mm -hmm. And so you want to put the bottom and the top of the teeth in the same plane as that little divot. So what I'm doing is I'm palpating that little spot in the back of her head where the bottom of her skull is. And then I'm going to have her raise her head up just a little bit. Now drop her mouth, drop her chin down. Be careful when you ask them to open their mouth, people tend to do this. You want to keep the head in the same plane and just have them drop their chin, their mandible down, their jaw down. Okay, so I want this line here to line up with the bottom of the top of the teeth. I'm going to go down just a little bit right there. See that? Do you want to come around to the side so you can see it? Uh, <laughs> oh, I trapped you in over there, huh? Sorry. <laughs> Okay, now she's off center again, so we'll bring her <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah, my mouth open. Okay, so if it's just the top of the bottom, of the bottom and the top of the teeth in alignment here. So if you do this, the skull's going to be, the teeth are going to be in the way, and if you do this, the skull's going to be in the way. So you want a straight line from here to here. Okay, and I'll show you this again on the table. Okay, one more. We can do on the on the uh, upright, and that is the slimmer. What's the position called when we do an upright slimmer? Mm -hmm. Pointing? Yeah, Pointing. because what was this on the table one called? Palos. 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 Yes. I forgot that. Yeah, and I, did, I didn't mention it. I mean, I mentioned it in lecture, but I forgot to mention it in the after days. Like that. Okay, so come towards me just a little bit. All right, so we always put the arm that's against the IR up. So she's going to raise up her left arm. She can rest her arm across the top of her head. So it drops her shoulder down. And then this central ray is going to be still right at the earlobe. But we're going to, for the C-spine, we're going to go at C7 here. See that? If we're doing thoracic, we'd go down to T1. So here's C7. Call me a little bit tighter here. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of the radiologists want you to open it all the way to the top because they want a reference to count down the C-spine. The book shows you uh, something like this. But I think if we do this, this is the twining, the swimmer's position. If you do this, it's hard to get a reference point. So here's that little divot that I told you about right above the clavicle. The snuggle box. The snuggle box, right. So there's the snuggle box right there. And the C spine we're a little bit higher, but when you do the T spine, you're going to be right in this little divot right here. So if she's still having trouble with the shoulders, we can do this, or we can give her a weight and help her pull her arm down. The idea is to get the shoulders out of the same plane so we can see the C7, T1 interspace through the shoulders. Okay? You can see the light on. Or if it's a big guy and they can't, you can go ahead and give them a weight too. If we can't, if we don't have weights or they can't hold the weight, you can angle the tube. Uh, which direction? Five. Cuddle. Yes. Yeah. Five degrees cuddling. Which will still, the purpose is to get these two shoulders out of the same plane. Okay? I'm going to turn this in. <laughs> it's yeah. exactly even. Touch your shoulder. Okay, let's go on to the supine.
15 degree tube angle. The other thing I want to do is get rid of the pillow, pillow because it's going to cause an artifact. So it's a good idea when you're doing sea spines to get a couple small sponges so that you can, if you need to, you can give the patient a sponge. Especially if the patients are large or they're very kyphotic, it's hard for them to lay down on the table. Their head's going to go way back. You can support their head. For him, he's not really having a problem. He could just have his head straight down for this one. Okay, so I'm going to center on the Adam's apple at C4. So right, right at the EAM, C4, and here his manubrium, so we can see about T2, T3. We're centered to our cassette, and then we want to put our right marker. I'm just going to put it right here next to the skin line of the neck. I know it's not going to be in the anatomy because it's on the outside. Right? Mm. Okay. Now, what you don't want to do is if you get all set up here like this, and then you're getting ready to make your exposure and you realize at the last minute you forgot to angle, so you, you get this all set up, all nice and aligned, and then you're like, oh, shoot. Oh. And then what happens? Yeah. You've missed your anatomy, and that's a repeat. I had a student once tell another student, angle your tube. Yeah. During the simulation. That's why I told you guys not to talk to each other. Don't start flinching or getting seizures or something. Because mm. he would have lost points for not angling the tube, but he had a repeat yeah. now, and now he had a fail. So thanks a lot, right? So I, fa I was going to fail both of them just for the other one not um, speaking up, and he shouldn't have. So anyway, here we go. So here's the AP axial. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and do the oblites because I've already got my tube and my cassette aligned, so I need the body sponge. Thank you. Now a lot of you are getting mixed up with the sponge still. This is 45. This is 30. Okay, so you want to use the steeper angle. And then roll towards you. Now watch what happens to his head. When he tries to lay his head down, see how it's at a tilt? You want to have the head at level. So you want to get him a... Actually, I need the square one behind you, Sandy. So you want to give him some kind of support. Plus, it's going to be a lot more comfortable, right, than having your head all... If you have a neck x-ray, it's probably because they're having pain. You don't want to be all tweaked. <laughs> okay, so now I'm just going to recenter him. The other thing I want to do is lift the mandible up a little bit and turn the head so that the line MSP, see his MSP still isn't quite straight. Sorry. I just poke you in the eye. So here's the MSP parallel to the image receptor. Okay. And notice where the CR ends up. Right at the earlobe. Yeah. Now, one thing you can do on oblice, again, as I said, you could tilt the tube uh, along the long axis of the part here, but I don't know if they want you to do that anymore at the hospital. So, so this is the... What position? RPO. RPO to demonstrate RPO. the... Left. 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 Inner vertebral frame. What do we demonstrate in the lateral? What articulation are we demonstrating? Spinous crosses. Cyclopopocele. Psychomatic. Put your chin up. All right, lift your chin up and turn it to the lateral. Turn your chin back a minute. Now, if you're doing a trauma patient, you would keep the head at a 45 degree. You would not move the part. Right, or if it's follow up from surgery, or you have to make sure and find out what the diagnosis is. This is a three day post op, post -op follow up. You don't necessarily want to be twisting the head. But in a regular C spine, we're just going to move the head to the lateral. And again, we're going to end up with the, the uh, central ray right at the earlobe, right at the sternocleidomastoid. mastering. Now, because he's in the left oblique, it would be better preferred to use the left marker here. Okay. Right, right in a vertebral foramen, but it's a left oblique. Usually the rule is you mark the side that you turn towards, but it could be your hospital wants you to put your right marker because this is the right inner vertebral foramen. Just don't put your mar right marker on the left side. 
right? No, wrong. On the correct side. Okay, so what's left of the regular series? The dontoid. The dontoid. Right, now you gotta go perpendicular. Perpendicular. Usually your patient doesn't have to <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Now one thing you may not have a sponge for the AP, but for the odontoid, it's going to be helpful if you get one of these small angle sponges. And you'll learn this later when you do skull too, because when you give them a sponge, it's easier for them to, to flex their chin down. If you try it, that's pretty hard on your muscles here. And a lot of you are young and flexible still, but these older patients, they can't bend their head down. So if you give them a sponge, you're going to have a better chance. And that's what I was talking about in the classroom, how now the muscles are more relaxed than when they're standing like this. So I think you have a better chance of getting the odontoid. But Erica says she gets hers better upright, right? So I guess it just depends on. <coughs> like you said, when people are standing, they naturally, when they open their mouth, they naturally go back. Uh -huh. And then when they're laying down, they naturally go forward when they open it. And it just yeah. kind of like confuses me. So I guess it's just upright every time. <laughs> well, whatever works, right? Okay, so again, I'm going to feel for the back of the skull. Open your mouth. Open. Now see, this time he did it. Most of the times when he's been opening his mouth, he's been tilting his head back at the same time. So we have the bottom and the top of the teeth. Good Let's patient. Just a little bit. Okay, the bottom and the top of the teeth in alignment with the back of the skull. See it? So you have to either palpate for the mastoid tip or palpate for this little divot back here and just imagine a straight line. If you're having difficulty or if you have dental work, then you can do a five degree angle which will help protrude the skull off the tip of the odontoid case and relax. Can you go by um, like the bottom of the teeth and the, like the earlobe, the bottom of the earlobe? Some was so, so well, the earlobe probably, but some people have like different kinds of earlobes. Some people mm -hmm. have little tiny ears, some people have real big ears, so that may not be a good landmark. For him it works, because if you look at the mastoid tip, the earlobe is probably at the same place, right? Mm -hmm. So that might be another indication. Um, by the way, when you when we start practicing today, I want you to wash your hands and because you're going to be touching each other's faces and you know not to spread germs or anything, just to be clean. So make sure and go wash your hands and use the sanitizer stuff. Okay, so I've done the odontoid. Now I'm going to go ahead and go into the T-spine. You I still need to do the swimmers at all? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you that. Okay. What I was going to say is because he's in this position, I'm going to go ahead and do his T-spine, and then when I go to the lateral, I'll do the cross tables on the same time. Because I have to move the two. Huh? Oh, phew. Thank you. That's right. Okay, one more uh, additional. If we can't get the tip, what's the alternate position we would do? The fuse. The fuse. Okay, so I need that little square sponge again. What's our positioning? Hold on a second. What's our positioning for the fuchs? We have to do what with the head? Up. Chin, chin all the way up. So it straight line with the ear, right? Mental meagle line. That's pretty uncomfortable, even for someone who's done and flexible. So what I would recommend you do is get some kind of a, a either pillow or a sponge and lift them up so it goes under their shoulders here. Okay, now go ahead and tilt your head back. See, it's, it's much easier to position your head when you have that little lift under the shoulders. Do you see it? Okay, so now I've got the chin and the ear in the same light line, I mean. And we simply center right under the mentum, right under the tip of the chin. chin. Close collimation, about four by four inches. And again, I would just put my marker on the inside here because I know it's going to catch the light right underneath. Okay, so this is the fuse. I'm not going to have you do the jud since they don't have it in the book anymore, but you should know that the jud is the PA of the fuse. So it's still meant on the medial line, but he's prone instead of AP. The two is perpendicular. Two is perpendicular. Okay, all right, relax. Okay, so now I'm going to do the T spine. Do I need a 14 by 17 with that, please? Thank you. T-spines, um, it doesn't really matter blocker up or blocker down because they're going to be primarily in the center of the cassette. Okay, so I'm going to adjust my 14 by 17. 
Okay, so right now I've got it open to 14 by 17. I'm going to center at the MSP. And then what's my top to bottom articulation? What do I what do I center to for the top to bottom? Two seven. Yeah. And how do I know that? How do I know that from the front? Because I can't feel T7. Um, right above the xiphoid. So here's the xiphoid, T9. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two inches. Here's the manubrium, T3. So you're about halfway in between. One thing, though, you can go by is if you relax the shoulders down, you should have about an inch of line above the shoulders. If the light's hitting here and it's, it has this thyroid cartilage, what is, where is it? What level is it? C4, C4, right. So then we know we've got six and seven here. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you should only need to have about a half an inch to an inch of light above the shoulders. Make sure you're at the MSP. Here's uh, his xiphoid process. So I know I have 10, 11, 12, and L1 here. And they collimate side to side about the width of the neck. There's no need to keep the beam wide open. You're not. You're going to just demonstrate more scatter. Yeah, like an AP chest, except you collimate in. Yeah, that's why this. Some of the things we're doing now, you've already done. You've just maybe changed the collimation, right? Okay, so or the top of the line. Well, on him, not all people. What I'm gauging by is the shoulders here. See that? Okay, so you go by. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to put my marker here. Because the spine's going to be right down the middle, so this won't get in the anatomy here, but it'll still show up on the film. Okay, and what about... you want to see light on top of the shoulders? Is that what you said? Yeah, well, when I had it open, that's why I had it open, so you could see the light. Okay. But I don't want to see light oh, okay. here. Okay. Because then I'm going to be centered way up into the C-spine. <coughs> so I, that's why I always started with my beam open so I could see this, but then I'm going to call it to the cart. Okay? And you want it the width of the neck, basically. Okay. And then what's my breathing instructions? Take a full breath. Yeah, just take a breath and hold it. It doesn't necessarily, the diaphragms are going to be going like this, so it doesn't really matter where they are if you do expiration, inspiration. I've just always done inspiration. So take in a deep breath and hold it. Okay, expose. Okay, now I'm going to do the lateral. So I'm going to have him turn over to his left side. Now, again, you're going to have him bring his arm up under his head, but you want to give him some kind of a sponge because it's not going to be very comfortable to have his neck all, his head all twisted, right? So we want to bring the arms 90 degrees from the chest. And, the, and one of the reasons for doing that is so you can feel the shoulder blades because you want to make sure that you don't have any rotation. People tend to lay on the table like this because it's more comfortable, but you want to make sure and get the shoulders back so that your hand's perpendicular and the hips. Because sometimes you'll have the shoulders down and the hips will be straight, or the hips will be down and the shoulders will be crooked. You're getting a chiropractic adjustment today, huh? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to make sure that he's lateral. I also want to make sure that the spine is parallel to the image receptor, which this time he ended up okay. Sometimes I have to do a little like this to make sure it stays straight. Okay, so where do I center for the T-spine? No, just up behind the uh, MS, uh, yeah, about MCP. <laughs> one inch posterior to the MCP. So what turns one to two inches, so it turns out that the light is going to be right about at the MCP. See, here's the MCP, but remember the spine's going to curve back. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to you don't want to call it too tightly because you also have to allow for the in inner curve here, outer curve here, and then it goes back in here. So you want about four inches here. That. So if the light's here, also notice that the light's fairly skim, uh, skimming the skin line on this side. So you don't want to see this. You don't want to see a lateral chest. Oh, you want to see just, you look at the light where it's just skimming the skin line, the front light should be right at the MCP, and then that puts you two inches posterior to the MCP. Okay? Two inches or two fingers? Well, my three fingers is two inches. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, the other... What was that? Oh, I felt all this air. Was that oh, you? Yeah, what was that? <laughs> okay, now the other thing is T7 is really center. Okay. And so you can palpate the inferior border and go just below that. One thing you want to keep in mind, here's his waist. So I know I've got L1. I'm not so concerned about 
T1, T2, because I'm going to see it on the swimmers. I'm not going to see it on this one. But you want to make sure and show T12, L1. T12 and L1 is a common place for compression fractures for older patients. Plus, it's easier to count the vertebra if you show L1, because it's a little confusing in this projection. The other thing you want to do is to help uh, reduce the scatter on your image to put a, either an apron or a lead strip right there. Now, be careful. Don't let it go in like this. <laughs> you don't put it right against the skin tissue because then you're going to be also blocking or covering some of the rib anatomy that's closer to the spine. So just have it right at the skin line. Okay? Can you see it, George? Well, here's C7, so we're getting like T2 down to L1. Because this is going to be demonstrated in a minute with the swimmers. So what I'm saying is if you center like this, which a lot of people do, then you may not see L1, and it's harder to figure out if you've gotten all the thoracic. If you center at T7 here, then you can always get this one with your swimmers, because you always do a swimmers on the thoracic, whether it's ordered, you know, C-spine is optional, but T-spine is part of the routine. Um, one of the questions that came up today is on the C-spine, if you have to do a swimmers, is that considered a repeat? And it's not really, it's additional, yeah. Okay, so what am I going to do about his um, breathing? Breathing. Right, so I'm going to just tell him to remain and take slow, shallow breaths, and mm -hmm. this is one of those long exposures. Okay, so this is probably one of the most commonly repeated exams. I'm not sure why. I don't know if it's because of the rotation or they're getting the technique right for the breathing technique. Although with your CR systems, you've got a better chance of getting a better image now. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the swimmers for the T-spine. So all we have to have him do is bring his arm down by his side. So he relaxes his shoulder down. Here's C7, so I'm going to center at T1. I'm going to center him front to back here. Calm it down. Now the book again will show you some really Sorry. close collimation like this. But I think it's better to include a little more of the C-spine so you can get your reference. So see how the light ends up right at the crook of the, the little snuggle box there? See, here's, here's his clavicle here. Here's the trapezius muscle, so it's like right above this little, where the neck attaches to the shoulders. Okay? And so we're going to demonstrate C7, T1, T2, T3. And tell him to stop chewing his gum if he's chewing gum. <laughs> Okay? And then, if, again, if the patient's really large, we could go ahead and do a five degree cephalic angle, which will also help get through this with the um, shoulder blades here. Questions? Okay. Let's do the cross table laterals now. So go ahead and go on your back. Turn around this way. <laughs> okay, so how, what distance are we at when we do the C spine upright? 72. So our goal is to get this image receptor as far as possible. We can only get it to about 44 inches here. Go ahead and step on the brake here. I'm going to move him as far as I can. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the way you jumped back, I wasn't sure what happened. <laughs> I don't know. I was without letting my foot off. Oh. Okay. And then I'm going to center just like I centered before. Now, Erica's getting um, set up for something. I'll address that in a minute. Sorry. That's okay. So it was ready for you. No, I, I appreciate it. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, so see the centering is still at the earlobe, still halfway between the front and the back. Now, typically, we don't, we may or may not have to build up his head. If he's on a C collar and a backboard, then we wouldn't build him up because he's going to have the C collar. If he's just a regular cross table lateral, you want to have the neck straight. See that? And then the collimation could be a little bit closer. Okay. 
And then my marker would go right where you see the light right there. Which marker should I use? The right. Yes, because it's the right lateral. Okay, she's going to put the marker on for me. <laughs> okay, now oftentimes in the cross table, because they're laying down, it's much harder to get the shoulders down because you don't have the gravity to help you. So you can ask them to try to reach down for their toes. Go ahead and reach down for your toes. And see how for him he can do that, but some patients you can't. So this is where you see people pulling on the shoulders. <coughs> so what we do is we're going to put on a lead apron. Put one on? No, it's okay. We don't have to go through that. <laughs> but I would, and you as students do not do this because you are not allowed you to hold patients together. Yeah, but I'm going to show you. If most hospitals don't have these, okay. if they have them, they have them for like a week, and then they disappear, right? So in the in most cases, you'll see someone do this, where they just stand at the bottom of the patient and pull the shoulders down, right? Mm -hmm. Or here, if they have something to strap around the wrist, with a lead apron on. But you as students should not want to either pull down on the shoulders or, or be holding the patient. So you're going to be the one behind making the exposure. We have these fancy straps, and if you bend the leg slightly, we can affix them to the tops of the feet and use your body to pull your own shoulders down. So that's what's nice about these straps. But I rarely see them at the hospital because they get thrown off and put in the laundry and then that's the end of it. But see as he strains his legs out, see how it naturally pulls his shoulders down? So that's the yeah. best device. That way you don't have to have a second person in the room getting a, a secondary exposure. But. So you can tell the patient to just relax and you pull the shoulders down and then that hopefully will see the C17 one. So we still don't have it though. Now what are we going to do? Still can't see C17 one. Right. So now I just bring this arm up, rest it against his forehead. I'm going to recenter this slightly. Okay, so I'm again centered right at this little divot here. That's the cross table swimmers. Oh, like this. What you don't want to do is have the arm all the way down where the humerus is over the C spine. That's why I do this, where it pulls the arm up and out of the way. But they still stay lateral. It's right here. It's giving this little this little divot right there. See that? See how it's crossing right here? So it's going through T1, C7. And so we've got it center to the film here. Because the whole point is to see the alignment. Can you use grid? grid? Yes. Yeah. You you don't have to use a grid on the C-spine, but I think it's easier just to remember to use grid on all cross tables. Mm -hmm. This you would absolutely have to, but on the regular C-spine, the part's not really that thick. But getting through the shoulders is more difficult. So, And I think the CR systems are more sensitive to scatter anyway, so I think they use grids more than we would used to in the old film screen environment. Would okay. You, would you sponge them up would I do what? Table. Would you use the sponge? Yeah, I have a sponge under his head. But not his neck. The neck has a natural curve, so you probably don't. And plus, he's on a pad. Now, remember, some cross tables, and this will be more when we get to trauma, they'll come in on a backboard. So that's going to naturally elevate them off the table. Now, I'm going to show you two ways to do the T-spine here. Got it? Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm going to go ahead and... Um, now, by the way, and i got to yell at the morning group because they're the ones that are doing it, but we've got enough sandbag sponges and things for each room, so I don't want any cross-contamination. No, no sleeping from the other room, okay? Because all the sponges this morning disappeared and ended up in that room. And I know it wasn't you guys, it was the morning group, but just, you know, we've got the supply. So I'm building him up here because he doesn't have a backboard to lay on. Okay. I'm going to scoot you away from me just a little bit. Okay, so I have some room here. So we absolutely have to have a grid on the T-spine to cut down on the scatter. Okay, so now what do I need to do? I'm going to move this tape or tube down, so watch out there. Arms? Yes, get the arms up out of the way. So we can either bring them up or he can rest them up above his head. Okay. Again, this, the central ray is going to be one inch posterior to the mid-coronal plane. So here's this MCP, so I'm going just below that. And see how the light's skimming here? Because remember, the back is sinking into the pad. Okay, 
case. So that would be the cross table thoracic. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with this, even though I built him up, go ahead and sit up. See how it's in the lower half of the cassette? Okay, go ahead and lay down, John. So another option you could do, because the CR is really particular about getting the part in the middle of the cassette, is use your Bucky as a support. See that? Mm. So nothing has changed here. The centering on him is still going to be the same. Step on the brake. I don't know what happened, but we ended up being off center here, so let me go back. Maybe he moved when he sat up. Okay, so his centering is going to remain the same, but because I've elevated him by putting the cassette down, look where the centering ends up now. See, now it's right in the middle of the cassette, which will give you a better image for your CR. So utilize the two. Sometimes they'll use the laundry carts and put them alongside the table or the gurney. Okay? <laughs> okay, questions? No. All right. So you're going to have about an hour and a half, yeah? I've seen when they did the C-spines a couple times. Do I elevate it on the cross table? Mm -hmm. The problem is if you have used towels, sometimes they show up as an artifact. So it just depends. If he was laying flat on this table, absolutely I'd have to elevate him. But he was on this pad, and then he had a small pad under his head, so we can only bring him up to the center of the cassette. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, questions? All right, good off. Thank you.